Assalamualaikum students. So this is to pick off where we left off in the last lecture where we uh, constructed the hemoglobin oxygen disso dissociation curve. And now we'll be uh, looking a bit more deep into uh, the already identified flat portion, uh, the so-called flat portion of the curve and the steep portion of the curve. Okay. Uh, so the flat portion will be referred to as the plateau portion while the steep portion is the steep portion. And to introduce this, uh, this, this whole uh, angle, uh, the plateau portion is, uh, buffer, uh, is, is signifies or, or showcases the, the immense uh, ability of hemoglobin to buffer against fluctuating AO2s, uh, PO2s at high altitudes. So we know that at high altitude, air pressure, uh, the partial pressure of gases decreases. Uh, and of course, PO2 in the in, in the atmospheric air decreases. So, how does uh, hemoglobin uh, deal with this situation? It it deals with it beautifully. We'll we'll look at it uh, uh, through this curve. And uh, in deep sea, uh, the reverse happens, and the pressures, all of the pressures, they really increase. Uh, so, how does hemoglobin deal with that? So, that's that's the plateau portion. So, in the plateau portion, you will be looking at high altitudes and the opposite deep seas. And in the steep portion, we'll see that when uh, the requirement for, ex, uh, for, for oxygen consumption increases, so we know that at base level, it's, uh, it's 5 ml of, of oxygen per deciliter of blood or 250 ml of oxygen in a minute. But what if you, you go into exercise and, you, and the requirement for oxygen is, 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 is more than uh, the usual, the routine? How does the hemoglobin oxygen curve helps us understand the behavior of hemoglobin in allowing more oxygen to be released uh, in in exercise scenarios or strained in uh, uh, scenarios uh, this also will come into uh, the picture in the following slide so let's see what is the significance uh, in detail of the plateau portion uh, let's look at some stats uh, these are two extremes that a human being can undergo okay uh, at heights at uh, very high altitudes the PaO2, which is the atmospheric uh, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, can fall as low as 60. Okay, um, and in the depths of sea, it can go as high as 500 mmHg. Now we know that we have studied this uh, graph up till now uh, uh, at sea level. Okay, uh, so at sea level, there are there are uh, there are normal for us normal. Uh, P atmospheric PO2s uh, and so uh, our body is adjusted to, to the sea level atmospheric PO2s okay uh, when when this changes for a for a city dweller or for a for a person who is at sea level when it changes over so this person when he goes to a high altitude place uh, and if it's really high altitude and the person is let's say fit uh, then uh, he or she goes uh, uh, undergoes uh, maybe a few hours or maybe a day or two uh, worth of acclimatization something which we will discuss in a in a later lecture what is acclimatization but acclimatization basically is a physiological process uh, by which uh, the body adjusts to these low po2s okay so when this person goes up there uh, a few days he struggles with uh, hyperventilation or uh, not being able to uh, do any strenuous exercise uh, or effort uh, but then uh, very very interestingly it changes uh, in, a, in, a, in a few uh, hours or maybe a day or two and then the person can f uh, 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 fly up a, a, a staircase or uh, run about and jog and this that the other climb a mountain so how does that come about uh, that is uh, the main the, the main focus of uh, this discussion as far as oxygen hemoglobin uh, dissociation curve is concerned uh, and uh, on, on the converse when we go in deep sea the PO2 uh, atmospheric PO2 can go up as high as 500 mmHg you can imagine at sea level is around 100 but at deep sea it can be 500 mmHg uh, so the, the way hemoglobin and oxygen, uh, the, 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 the way their relationship has been set, it beautifully caters for both of these extremes as we'll see in the graph. Look at it step by step. Let's first sort out what happens if the PO2, uh, atmospheric PO2 
uh, were to fall to say 60 mmHg. So I've uh, pre-labeled this uh, Guyton diagram. Uh, you must be familiar by now with the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Okay. Now let's just focus on the blue curves. Okay. So P atmospheric PO2, i.e. the available uh, PO2, has dropped from 100 or around 100 to 60 mmHg. Okay, which is depicted right here. So if 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 a if a line is to be drawn from 60, it would intersect the curve at this point, this point that I'm moving here. Okay, and when you look at 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 this PO2, what would be the hemoglobin saturation? It would come around 89. Okay, so at atmospheric PO2 of 60, or if you were to give uh, 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 a PO2 uh, supply of oxygen to a person at 60 mmHg, uh, this person's hemoglobin saturation would drop from uh, 97, 98, around no the normal uh, uh, point, down to only 89. Having understood what happens to the arterial blood, now we obviously are concerned about uh, in this situation of oxygen scarcity, would we get our 5 ml? Of oxygen per deciliter or not because that's the whole point well so let's what what we do is just look at on, on your right at P uh, at uh, the uh, saturation hemoglobin saturation of 89 this round here is the volume percent of oxygen okay now simply count 5 down from this okay so 18 17 16 15 and around 14 this is it and guess what 14 is where exactly where the hemoglobin saturation is when it has given those 5 ml of oxygen per deciliter so it drops to around 65 uh, hemoglobin percent which corresponds to a po2 of 35 mmhg okay so if you compare what from the normal, what normally happens that this is uh, uh, the saturation is around 97% and it drops to 75% from the normal normal uh, curve data. And if you drop PO2, PO2, atmospheric PO2 from 100 to 60, then that normal uh, arterial uh, hemoglobin saturation drops from 97 or 98 to 89 which is again a pretty decent figure and the venous uh, hemoglobin saturation uh, drops from 75 to 65 again not a very big huge change uh, which reflects in the huge change of the atmospheric po2 okay so this is the this is the this is the power this is the beauty of the 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 way hemoglobin deals with its oxygen uh, and and allows only a certain drop in PO2 to release enough oxygen which is required by the body okay so that the hemoglobin saturation drops accordingly okay uh, uh, one way of remembering this whole discussion is that you need to give the tissues for every deciliter of blood every 100 ml of blood 5 ml of oxygen 5 ml okay this is the key so whatever uh, uh, arterial uh, whatever po2s you are given if say in a uh, say in a question you will need to calculate how does it affect the arterial uh, hemoglobin saturation then plot the corresponding po2 in blood then the venous uh, hemoglobin saturation and then the corresponding po2 of the venous blood and uh, you're good to go. Uh, we look at what happens in deep sea. The PaO2, as mentioned uh, earlier, rise up, rises up to 500 mmHg. Uh, this this very very high uh, PaO2. Uh, how much uh, uh, can it saturate the hemoglobin? Obviously, the answer is not more than 100%. Right? It already normally at a uh, hundred PO2. The saturation of hemoglobin is 97-98%, right? So there's only a give of 2% uh, um, in, in saturating the 
the full thing, right? So no matter how high you expose the hemoglobin to uh, uh, to a uh, to a source of oxygen, no matter how high that PO2 may be, it can only go to 100%. It's a logical point. So uh, the Guyton diagram actually ends up at 140. But even if you if you were to raise it to 500, obviously the curve will just extend in a flat in a flat way because this is 100 percent this right here is 100 percent okay so i i plot the maximum that the guyton diagram mentioned which is 140 at 140 uh, po2 might as well make it 500 or whatever it will go up to 100 percent of hemoglobin saturation so uh, nothing spectacular has happened even when you have increased the pao2 to a very high value and then again you do the you do the math you take 5 ml of oxygen out of this blood out of each deciliter of blood and see how the po2s drop and the uh, and the attendant uh, hemoglobin uh, saturation drops so interestingly what we see that the po2 drops to when you take out that 5 ml uh, requisite oxygen it drops to just above 40 okay 40 being the normal so it's just above 40 and the saturation uh, stays at uh, around 75 percent uh, it is 75 percent so just just slightly above 75 percent obviously these arrows are horrendously big so it would be a bit more than 75 percent 75 percent being the normal so you can imagine uh, that such a huge change in the in the in the atmospheric po2 has not really uh, changed the hemoglobin uh, saturation much has not uh, in, the, in the arterial blood has not done a very big change in the venous blood and uh, even though the PAO2s were uh, 500s and and slightly above 40 and this is the buffering action of hemoglobin and the significance of the plateau portion so in summary plateau portion is uh, it becomes operable at high altitudes uh, and deep sea uh, situations. So the second uh, point is whatever is the significance of the steep portion. Okay. Now, before I explain the steep portion, let me explain to you where does this uh, uh, the 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 lower limit of 40 mmHg comes. You must be wondering uh, if you haven't uh, studied the initial part of this chapter in Guyton, where he talks about the oxygen tension in the tissues. So the tissue obviously is, is alive and kicking and it's using oxygen and producing carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions and this and that. Uh, let's just look at the oxygen. So its consumption of oxygen uh, leads to this, this statistic that you need 5 ml of oxygen per every deciliter of blood uh, to the tissues of the body uh, if you don't want to uh, mess things up. Okay. Uh, so when the arterial blood fully loaded with around 95 mmHg of oxygen comes into the tissues. The tissues are thirsty for oxygen. Okay. And the interstitial average interstitial oxygen tension is around 40. This is where the 40 comes. So now you know that this whole thing becomes operationalized that when a PO2 of 95 in, in, in a fluid, say blood comes in an atmosphere where the surrounding uh, uh, fluid has oxygen tension of only 40, obviously there is a gradient between 95 and 40. And we know that oxygen only can diffuse following the simple diffusion pathway. So it obviously starts to pour out, okay, from the 95 to the 40, and then further down into the cells, it's around 23 mmHg, okay. And the cells obviously are continually using this oxygen okay which keeps this gradient of 40 in the interstitium roundabout stable so that whenever there is fresh blood there will always be a gradient okay so this is where the 40 comes from so this interstitial place is a busy place so that is where the 40 comes from what if the uh, the requirement of the body increases what if the cells start to use more oxygen they become more thirsty than before than at rest okay what happens then then obviously the cellular oxygen would go would drop it will borrow more from the interstitial oxygen which will drop the 
the 40 mm AG down to say let's say uh, 5 less than 40 to 35 or maybe if, it, if you're really getting it 10 to 15 uh, uh, mm AG drop uh, can also uh, happen in strenuous exercise uh, to the interstitial VO2s. Now in this situation what will happen? Well when now your freshly oxygenated blood will come into the tissue it will find what will it find it will not find its regular routine uh, 40 mmhg barrier what will it find it will find maybe 35 mmhg maybe 30 maybe 25 so this is where now we are talking about the steep portion because in the in the flat portion the plateau portion uh, the hemoglobin is pretty stingy with its oxygen if you if you know what i mean we've discussed this already the release of oxygen for huge changes so if you look at this portion here and correlate it with this this here let me just uh, label it for you so if this is the portion right here lib approximately this is where the whole thing is normally let's say 100 ish and then it goes back to oops it goes back to 40 so this is approximately this is approximately the the po2 changes uh, that occur for the arterial blood under normal conditions and look at the release of oxygen it's very stingy as i said let me just uh, make it with another color it is so it operates around here it's a very small thing okay now now the situation is that we are in exercise okay and this 40 mmhg barrier right here right here so this this bit here get here so right about this point here this is not enough you need more oxygen to be released so anything below below this blue dot will invite the steep portion of the curve or uh, in non mathematical terms uh, you are asking more oxygen from hemoglobin in simple terms okay and it obliges so it's its stinginess is only at 40 mmhg uh, po2 corresponding to 75 percent uh, saturation of the hemoglobin okay anything which is less than 40 percent totally changes the relationship of hemoglobin and oxygen and they really hemoglobin really starts to dish out its oxygen now just look at uh, what is happening here from this portion to this portion okay so this is the steep portion or or the or the steepest steepest part of the steep portion okay and look at the change look at the change in pressures it's it's very small very small changes in po2 really releases big big amounts of oxygen it's because of the shape of the curve right now let's say it in in english so in during the steep portion uh, hemoglobin and oxygen the relationship changes such that any little change in po2 in partial pressure of oxygen will really uh, uh, reflect in a large amount of oxygen leaving the hemoglobin it's it's uh, uh, it's it's a large release of oxygen as compared to its change in po2 okay and there are two reasons one is well i've just explained one reason this is that one reason the other is very importantly if you remember hypoxia in systemic circulation causes vasodilation so you uh, are not just uh, uh, asking each deciliter of blood to to release more oxygen you're actually getting more deciliters of blood okay so you're getting more des more blood in and from each unit uh, you are getting more oxygen out okay so this is what happens during the steep portion of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve so in summary uh, hemoglobin ensures that a, a constant supply of oxygen is available to the body no matter what the situation with po2 is 
you may be uh, uh, going and uh, visiting high altitude areas or deep sea diving of course with proper equipment it does not really matter uh, or if you are exercising you can be exercising mildly moderately or uh, really pushing it and doing heavy exercises it the the structure and the relationship of hemoglobin that it has with oxygen uh, which is evident through the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve uh, 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 tells us how it ensures a a steady supply of whatever your oxygen needs are in these very variable situations.